Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the SOAS General Elections hostings. Uh, my name is Ali, and I'm the president of the SOAS Ahl Bayt Islamic Society. And we've organized this event in collaboration with the SOAS SU. Um, this is part of the Current Affairs Lecture Series. And we are very happy to welcome Tom Brick MP, Liberal Democrat MP for Carl Shelton and Wallington. He's also the Deputy Leader of the House of Commons and Assistant Government Whip. Um, to his left is Natalie Bennett, the Green Party Leader and Parliamentary Candidate for Hoban and St. Pacras. Um, starting from the far left, um, we, ha we have, sorry. <laughs> we have Will Blair, Conservative Parliamentary Candidate for Hoban and St. Pancras. And to his right, we have Nick Slingsby, Labour Parliamentary Candidate for the cities of London and Westminster, and also an XOA student. And the debate is going to be chaired by Tom Oliver. Um, you can tweet throughout the whole event using hashtag SOAS debates. And on to Tom. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so before we begin with the um, questions that were sent in to the SU, we're going to be doing five minutes from each of the candidates. Um, so I think we should probably do alphabetical order, just because it's easier and unbiased. Um, so we'll start with the Conservatives. Will Blair, five minutes. Thank you very much, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for inviting me here to SOAS. It's um, uh, great to see so many people here tonight on a Friday night when I'm sure you'd be uh, rather doing something else, but I'm really delighted to see you've come here to listen to what we've got to say to you tonight. Um, I'm uh, the Conservative parliamentary candidate here in Hoban and St Pancras, which um, extends all the way from Highgate up in the north all the way down to Bloomsbury, Hoban Covent Garden in the south. I've lived in this area since I moved to London seven years ago. I live in Kentish Town at the moment and I, live, uh, I work in, in Hoban, so I know the area very well. But let me just set out very uh, hopefully succinctly why I believe um, you should all vote Conservative on May the 7th. Um, this Conservative-led government has a record that we can be proud of. We've um, delivered an income uh, cut, a tax cut for 25 million working people. We've cut our deficit by half. 1.85 million people, more people are in work now. We've created 1,000 extra jobs for every day this coalition government has been in office. Uh, more people from disadvantaged backgrounds are going to university than ever before under this government, with more affordable graduate repayment contributions system is in place. We've increased the state pension to 800, by £800. Pounds. Um, we've got a million more pupils in good and outstanding schools, and over 70,000 uh, families now have a home to call their own thanks to our Help to Buy scheme. I'm proud of that record. I think it's impressive. I think we've achieved a lot, but there's a lot more that we need to do. We'll eliminate the deficit by the end of the next Parliament, and this matters, the deficit matters, because the failure to deal with it will endanger precious institutions in our society like the NHS and all the vital services that we've come to rely on. Countries that haven't tackled their deficit have had to make cuts to their health budgets. Greece is a good example. They've had to cut their health budget by 15% because of their failure to get to grips with their spiralling deficit. Portugal, even more, 17% cut to health spending in Portugal thanks to the failure uh, to manage their economy and get their deficit under control. That's why the deficit, deficit's important. But I want to talk positively. Under the next government, we'll be able to deliver more homes, more jobs, more investment, growth and prosperity, more spending on the NHS under a Conservative government, and a commitment to spend at least 0.7% of our gross domestic product on international development, helping the poorest people across the world. And we have an obligation to do that. That's something I'm very proud of. These are pledges that the Conservatives can and will deliver if we are elected uh, in May. The UK was the fastest growing major economy last year, and we've now got inflation down to unprecedentedly uh, low records. Um, we simply cannot afford to throw all this progress away by letting Labour back in. A vote for them, or for any other party for that matter, is a vote for chaos, confusion, and above all, an economic, another economic crisis uh, that will cripple our country. Now, more than ever, Britain needs strong and clear leadership, and only a Conservative vote can ensure a strong and stable government 
to deliver prosperity and security for you and your family. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Will. Next alphabetically is Natalie with the Greens. So, Natalie, you have five minutes. Great. Well, um, I wonder if a vote for Tories is a vote for Hyperbole, perhaps. Uh, but, um, again, I'll echo the welcome, however. Uh, this is the constituency, Hoban and St Pancras, in which I'm standing. Um, I live in Summers Town, just on the other side of the Euston Road, uh, so I'm very well aware of the air pollution issues around here that uh, you will encounter as students every day. This is a really big election. We had the financial crash in 2007 and 8, and we had the election in 2010, and people then more or less thought that our economic model, the way we were doing things, could continue as it had before. Very, very few people now believe that. If you ask the survey, you do the surveys and ask people, do you think your children and grandchildren will have a better life than you've had? Increasingly, people are answering no to that question. We're clearly headed in the wrong direction. You might want to call it neoliberalism. You might want to call it neo-Thatcherism. You might want to call it simply the politics of Blair, of Brown, of Cameron and Clegg. But this is not delivering. And I entirely disagree with my conservative colleague here. Uh, an economy in which more than one in five workers is on less than a living wage, in which the number of zero hours contracts are exploding, in which more than one in four children is living in poverty, despite the fact that two thirds of those households have at least one person in work. That's not an economy that's working for the common good. It's not an economy that's working at all. This government came in promising to make work pay. Instead, what they've done is make work pay a lot less. What we've also seen, of course, is a huge attack on the poorest and most vulnerable in our society. That's what austerity is, making the poor, the disadvantaged and the young pay for the error and fraud of the bankers. What we need to do instead is not more austerity of the heavy austerity or the aust uh, light <coughs> austerity of the Labour Party. What we need to do is turn around and say that we need to invest in the future, invest in all of your futures, invest in our energy system, invest in our housing. And that means to get the money to do that, we need to make multinational companies and rich individuals pay their way, pay their taxes and pay their staff properly. And we need to borrow. The deficit is an issue but we can borrow to do the things we need to do. So we want to borrow to build council housing, 500,000 council homes over the term of this parliament, money partly paid by moving, mostly paid by removing mortgage interest rate relief, but also allowing councils to borrow so they can build the homes so that then they get the rent from those homes. And since we also want to end right to buy, they can keep those homes indefinitely. That's where we want to go and of course, we want to and absolutely must tackle climate change. This is a critical year for action on climate change with the Paris talks. And the fact is the kind of things we need to do to tackle climate change are also the kind of things we need to do to make our society better. We need to ensure that everybody has a warm, comfortable, affordable to heat home. We need to make sure that people have the option of decent public transport that goes when, where, uh, and, and reliably where they want to go. And Privatisation. What an utterly failed model this has been. Privatisation is based on cutting the pay and condition of workers. It's based on cutting the quality of services and shoveling public money into private hands. Caroline Lucas, the Green MP, I'm proud to say this week, introduced the NHS reinstatement bill that would say that the profit motive has no place in health care and remove the market mechanism from the NHS. And I hope perhaps we might talk about that more later. We also want to bring the railways back into public hands. And then if we think about Britain's place in the world, we need to, after the disasters of the Iraq and Afghan wars, we need to think again. We need to think of Britain as a champion of human rights and democracy around the world. Build on the proud tradition we have that goes back, if imperfectly, to the Magna Carta that we've just been celebrating the anniversary of, and create a new place in which we are a force, a diplomatic force, for good democracy and peace. And we need to get rid of Trident nuclear weapons. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Natalie, for that speech. Um, next up is Labour. Would you like to, with Nick, Nick Slingsby? Uh, Hi everybody, good evening. Uh, my name's Nick Slingsby. I'm Labour candidate uh, for the City of London and Westminster and I'm actually a former SOAS student. Uh, I studied Mandarin Chinese here uh, between 1998 and 2002. So it's great to be back. It's great to see my university doing so well and it's great to see so many of you guys interested on a Friday night in this election that's going to determine uh, the future of you and also of our country. So, um, essentially, I, um, I studied here. I know exactly what it's like to be a student in London. I know what it's like to pay tuition fees. I know what it's like to try to find housing here. I know what it's like to try to find a job afterwards. I know what it's like to try to live on the maintenance grant. It's not a huge amount of fun the whole time. However, essentially, the Labour Party has actually got some plans for you on that, something that actually can make things easier for students. And I've just got to kind of put this out here. When I was a, stu a SOAS student, um, I campaigned against the tuition fees, which uh, the Labour Party itself did bring in. I wasn't always Labour. Uh, I actually made this decision as an adult, having read all of the facts about which party did offer the right policies in order to make a better Britain for us. So, this is one of the things that I want to talk to you about tonight, the tuition fees, Labour's policy on that, the reduction of the cap from £9,000 to £6,000, the commitment to increase the maintenance grant. These are solid proposals. They're costed. They won't add to the debt. It's the combination of radical ideas plus pragmatic implementation that I think sets the Labour Party apart and actually really gives you a viable opportunity to vote for a party that's going to do something to improve Britain. And this is not just on tuition fees here. This is a track record over the past 50 years that the Labour Party's had. It's had it from the foundation of the NHS. It's had it from the decriminalisation of homosexuality, the abolition of the death penalty. It's had it on the implementation of the minimum wage. There is a sustainable track record in making this country better. It's a viable alternative to what we face. And nowadays we're facing more and more challenges, globalization, uh, the radicalization of our youth, supposedly in universities. This is something that's being debated at the moment in the counterterrorism and the security bill. Uh, essentially, I'm sure you're all aware of uh, Theresa May's proposals in order to put a statutory obligation on universities to monitor for hate crimes. Uh, just today we found out that there's been an exemption to this statutory obligation on all universities. There's an exemption for Oxford and for Cambridge student unions. Um, you might ask which, uh, which university did Theresa May go to? Oxford University. Which university did David Cameron go to? Oxford University. Which one did George Osborne go to? Oxford University. I think actually, unfortunately, uh, this is just another demonstration of an us and them scenario here. An ill thought out policy that is only implemented on the sum and not on uh, David Cameron and his chumps. Also, I'd like to talk about the economy. Uh, Labour has uh, the economic recovery that we've uh, had in the past couple of years has actually come as a result of austerity dropping off in this past year, okay? So essentially the point to make isn't that it's, it's happening because of austerity, it is because we've tapered off austerity. So when we talk about things like pasty tax, bedroom tax, omni shambles, uh, I think that's probably a more like chaos and confusion than anything else. Anyway, uh, we're here to offer you a viable alternative from someone that actually knows what it's like to be in your uh, shoes. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nick. So the last speaker will be Tom Brake, MP from the Liberal Democrats, and then we'll move on to the questions that were submitted earlier. So Tom, five minutes. Great. Uh, thank you, Tom. And uh, can I also join by thanking you and uh, the university for 
uh, for hosting us this evening. Uh, I didn't go to SOAS, but I did go to Imperial College, and I think uh, our two universities have one thing in common, that is uh, rubbish accommodation, as I understand it. So um, I, I do remember very clearly the, the very cold winters that I used to have in the room that I shared with a, a fellow physics student where we'd, we had put plastic sheeting on the windows to try and keep the warmth in the room and it was very unsuccessful and the heaters that we had at our feet just about managed to, hit, to warm up our toes but not, not much more than that. So I wish you luck in your, your campaign to improve your, your students' accommodation. Uh, in terms of uh, the, the, the general election, I mean, we have set out a, a, a limited number of priorities for us. The first thing is to clear the deficit by 2018, so clear the deficit by two, uh, in the next three years. Why is that important and, and what does it mean? Uh, the deficit is the difference between what the government has got coming in in revenue and what the government is spending. And you can see that if the government continues to spend more than it's got coming in uh, in terms of taxes, then it builds up a debt. And we have been doing that for many years. And in practical terms, what this means now at this moment is that the interest that the government are paying on our debt, more money goes on paying that than, it go, than goes on paying for the police, uh, prisons, and the transport system. So if we continue to rack up debt, I think in the way that Natalie was suggesting, what that means is that the interest payments that we would have to make as a government uh, would go up, and the amount of money that we've got available to spend on things that we think are important, you think are important, whether it's health, transport, tackling crime and so on, would go down because of our interest payments going up. So that is why that's an important thing for us to do. The second thing that we want to continue uh, in the next parliament is reducing tax for people on low and middle incomes. Uh, there was a reference earlier to, uh, to the tax threshold. The fact that we have now increased the tax threshold to 10,500 10 pounds, that means that uh, everyone can earn 10,500 pounds before they pay any tax. And that is a benefit to 25 million people. It's Liberal Democrat policy. It's something that before the last general election, uh, David Cameron said was, un was unachievable. I'm pleased that, in fact, in coalition, we have, in fact, uh, been able to deliver that. And we want to see that tax threshold increase to £12,500 by the, next, the end of the next parliament. That means that people who are on the minimum wage will not be paying income tax. And I think we'd all agree that that is something that we should seek to achieve. If people are getting the minimum wage, it means they're not well paid. And the last thing they need to be doing is paying tax on it. So by the end of the parliament, we should achieve that. We want to guarantee spending for education from three to 19s because we still believe that, uh, and we'll come on to the tuition fees issue in a moment, that education is a, a priority for us and we should make sure uh, that every child has access to decent education. That's why we have put, uh, in effect, we've sort of front-loaded the spending uh, into nursery education uh, the, and things like the pupil premium to make sure that young people who need the most support get it in their early years at school or indeed at nursery because the evidence is that that is when that spending is most effective at ensuring that that child, perhaps if they're not supported particularly well at home, are getting that support in nursery, getting it in primary school so that they can then go on and do better at school uh, later on. I suppose at the other end of the age spectrum, uh, the NHS... Simon Stevens, who is the, the, the boss of NHS England, has said that he reckons that by 2020, the NHS will need an extra £8 billion spent on it each year to maintain the quality of, uh, of health care. So we would uh, prioritise that. And finally, the reason I got into politics 30 years ago, we have, uh, we've put environment again at the centre of our policy. I joined the Liberal Party in the early 80s because it was the party that was most committed uh, to the environment, and I, I certainly believe that is the case. Finally, in relation to tuition fees, we may come on to it in questions. I'm very pleased that Nick acknowledged that, in fact, it was the Labour Party that introduced tuition fees and then top-up fees in the 1997 and 2001 elections, uh, even though prior to the election they hadn't actually said they were going to do that. In fact, they said they weren't going to do it. We had to apologise quite rightly for the mistake that we made. I'm still waiting for the apology from the Labour Party for having introduced tuition fees and top-up fees in spite of the fact that they said that they wouldn't do it before those two elections and got elected with a very large majority and were in a position to deliver their policy if that's what they wanted to do. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Um, so we'll now move on to the submitted questions. People submitted their questions and they should have been told whether their question was accepted or not. So I'm hoping everyone is here who should be here. Um, if you could keep your question to your question, um, I'd prefer if you didn't go on a rant, rant just because, you know, we are, you know, the time um, is constrained. Um, please don't put your hands up yet. We will be taking questions later on from the audience, but these are submitted questions. Um, so the first question is from Gabriel Popham. Thank you very much. Hello. Um, with regards to real estate and housing, how do you aim to tackle the growing wealth gap between homeless or low-income citizens and rich expats currently living in London? So that was with, re with regards to real estate and housing, how do you aim to tackle the growing wealth gap between homeless or low-income citizens and rich expats currently living in London? Um, I think as Diane Abbott has quite a clear line on rent caps and such thing, maybe we should start with Nick and Labour? Absolutely. Um, well, I think uh, when you go to the heart of the housing crisis, it's a crisis of uh, supply and demand. Ever-increasing demand for housing uh, across the UK, particularly in London, and a diminished supply of that. Um, and so when you want to try to tackle the supply, essentially you need to have some radical policies to try to think about how to do so. We all know that kind of space is at a premium. One of the things that we'd like to do is to responsibly look at the green belt. Okay, the green belt uh, comprises about 23% of all of London's uh, uh, land area. About 59% of the green belt is actually farms. 7% of the green belt are golf courses. So that 7% is actually twice the size of uh, Kensington and Chelsea, which has 160,000 uh, inhabitants. If you do responsible uh, development of the green belt in certain areas, and we aren't talking about the whole of the green belt, what we're talking about is potentially 2% of it there, that would be able to provide a far greater amount of affordable housing. It's not only that, there's some innovative solutions if you have a look at developing over, over tube cuttings as well. So you've got kind of, for instance, the district line and the Piccadilly line go out to the west. You can build over the top of uh, those tube lines which provide uh, for uh, housing with uh, good transportation links. What does it mean to develop responsibly though? What how, does it mean? how does one develop responsibly? How does one uh, develop responsibly? One needs to make sure that it's actually not property developers that take all of the profit from this. For instance, you've got the tube cuttings. It's owned currently by London Underground. London Underground doesn't have a massive experience of building houses. However, what they can do is they can hire a developer uh, with a commitment to create social uh, and affordable housing as part of that and plough the profits of that back into uh, uh, the underground system and making affordable housing. It's not, this isn't a complete kind of pie in the sky idea. If you have a look at Hong Kong and their metro system there, the MTR, it's essentially a property company that runs uh, 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 metro lines between property developments. This allows them to keep the ticket prices low for the metro and also build affordable housing. Natalie, it's what do you think about building on the green belt? And the housing uh, issue in London specifically. Uh, okay, well, um, so short building on the green belt, um, no. Um, those, th th those golf courses, I, you know, I've got no objection to perhaps changing the use of those golf courses, but I'd like to see them growing food for London, market gardens. That's what we need to use a lot, of, lot more of the green belt for. Uh, but to come back to the sort of basic question, and we were talking about you, the issue of buy to leave is known as people who just buy a flat or a house in London and it sits there and they're using it as a store of wealth. And that really is the underlying problem here that we need to tackle, that houses have increasingly become treated primarily, thought about primarily as financial assets, not as homes. Now there obviously is a, a, a supply and demand problem, but there is also in Britain 700,000 empty homes. And one of the reasons for that is a lot of those homes are in the north and bits of the Midlands where uh, there's no economic opportunities. One of the things that we very much need to do is rebalance our economy away from London, away from the focus on the financial sector, create strong local economies around Britain 
so that people are able to want to live in those homes. Many of them now are forced to move into London, forced to move to the very extraordinarily high rents. Now, I also believe that we need to give private tenants security of tenure, five-year security of tenure, and we need to put rent caps on so that once you've moved in, your rent can't go up by more than the rate of inflation or a landlord rate of inflation each year. But underlying this really is the, the change we need to make away from houses as financial assets to regarding them as homes. And one of our other key aspects of that, which I mentioned in the start, was you know, we want to build a lot of so homes for social rent, genuinely affordable. And you know, do be careful of this word affordable, because uh, there's a, a development in Mount Pleasant, in Islington, approved by Boris Johnson, where an affordable four-bedroom flat, you'll need a household income of 100k a year to rent. That's the 80% of market rent theory of affordable, and that's not affordable at all. So what we need to do is, is basically start to stabilise house prices, start to move to a situation where these are homes that people feel secure in as private, whether they're private tenants, whether they're council tenants, or whether, whether they're homeowners, and just change our whole way we think about housing and rebalance our economy as well. Thank you very much. If this... <laughs> if, if the other panellists want to interject, you don't have to wait for me to call the party or your name. Please feel free just to go, obviously, within reason. Let's not be rude. <laughs> can, I, can I come in? Then? Of course. Yes, good. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. I think that the fundamental problem with, with housing is that there isn't enough of it, and therefore you need to build, build more. And I think the fact that there isn't enough of it is driving, first of all, the, the increases in, in house prices to a great extent, and also uh, the increase in rents. And therefore, I think there is now a, a cross-party agreement, almost, that there is a need for a big building program. It depends on, depending on the parties, there's a different figure that is being proposed. Uh, nationally, it's 500,000 pounds, sorry, 500,000 homes. Social rent. It, it's 300,000, and, and uh, I don't know what the other parties are proposing, but I suspect it's large numbers as well. And... Uh, so that, that needs to happen. And I think then when you've got more properties on the market, then things like rents will start to go down because at the moment for rented properties, it's very much a, a seller's market because they know that if, if the person who, who presents themselves doesn't want to pay that rent, then they've got someone else behind them in the queue uh, who's going to pay it. So that put, pushes rents up. I don't think that rent caps is something that would actually work the experience in other countries where they've introduced a rent cap is actually the number of properties on the rental market goes down. So it actually leads to fewer properties for rent uh, than is currently the case. And you can understand the logic of that. If a landlord knows that they're going to be locked into a rent perhaps that, that is set uh, either the rate of inflation or perhaps a, a, a lesser increase than that, then that, that landlord is probably more likely to sell the property uh, than they are to put it on the rented market. So if the parties that are advocating uh, a rent cap actually want to see a reduction in the number of rented properties, then I think that is what they would achieve uh, by doing that. We've actually launched a policy today uh, which is targeted at what, we, what many people know as the rent generation. In other words, the, uh, the, the working, young working people uh, who are in a job but they cannot afford to raise the deposit to enable them to buy a property because in, in London that deposit, uh, if you're lucky, might be £20,000. If you're unlucky, it might be thirty, or it might be more than that. And although they can afford to pay the rent on a month-by-month -month basis, they can't afford to, uh, to, to raise the deposit. So we've got a, a, launched a scheme uh, called Rent to Own where people will be uh, renting their property uh, they would not have to raise a deposit, but the, at the end of the 30 years of renting that property, very much like a mortgage but slightly longer, an extra five years, they would own that property if they had completed uh, that process of renting. And they'd be paying a, uh, a market rent for it, um, but that is what they're paying already in terms of renting if they're renting in, in the private sector. And I think that would free up uh, or that, that would enable a lot of, of working people who cannot raise the deposit uh, to buy their own properties. And the, by the end of the next parliament, we'd be see, we, we would expect to, to be able to provide something like 30,000 properties a year for people who are uh, adopting the, the rent-to-own uh, model that we've proposed. Um, I think uh, all the parties now would agree that we're in the midst of uh, a significantly damaging housing crisis. Um, 
But of course, it's only this government that's actually taken some steps to start addressing it. When we came into office, this country's rate of house building had fallen to its lowest level since the 1920s. And so we inherited a very serious situation. And in that time, we've been able to, de to deliver 700,000 new homes. But, you know, it's not just about numbers. It's actually about the practicalities of, of living here in London. I moved to London here after I left university. Um, I, I left university, well, it doesn't seem that long ago, although actually counting the years, it probably is. I've worked ever since. I've worked in, you know, reasonably paid jobs. I can't complain about that. But I've, I'm no closer to owning my own house as I was the day I left university. Um, and my rent went up last month. And uh, my bills obviously keep going up. And it's a very iniquitous situation whereby people of all incomes and none are really, really struggling. And we've really got to keep um, increasing our efforts to go on a huge house building programme. But if what, Natalie, if what Natalie says is true, though, all of the houses you've built are impractical because they're unaffordable. No, is that, that true? Are they unaffordable? That's, that's not true. Um, we've been building affordable homes since day one. And um, particularly, uh, affordable home, a new um, programme of starter homes has recently been announced. And these are not just affordable homes, but homes that are exclusively reserved for first-time buyers under the age of 40. You know, you, no speculators, no overseas developers, no people who are trying to, you know, um, increase their... Uh, their, their assets. These are people, ordinary hard-working people, who want to get their first step on the housing ladder. Um, re rents, particularly, are a very uh, you know, problematic issue, as, been, as has been raised before. And um, here in Camden, we've got one of the highest um, uh, ratios of income spent on rents um, and it's about 53% of, uh, you know, is the average um, spend on rent uh, of people living in Camden. And I think that's, that's absolutely wrong. And the way to deal with that is by building more homes. Because a lot of people can afford their mortgages, but they just can't afford uh, the, uh, the deposits. Um, in London, we've... Um, uh, uh, Boris Johnson has delegated nine new housing zones across the capital and we're going to establish a London Land Commission to make use of 100% of the brownfield sites, sites that are sort of ex-commercial, you know, not in use at the moment. There's a significant amount of that uh, being um, uh, not used across London at the moment. Would so, you build on the green belt? Well, um, we've got to look very carefully at the green belt. I mean, um, you know, Natalie wants to put allotments on golf courses, but, you know, I think what we need to do is make sure that we um, make sure that we, we look um, and talk to local communities. The green belt's there for a reason, but the, in my view, there are circumstances in which the green belt should be built on because the, you know it's not called a crisis for nothing. It's a fundamental crisis that you know is is in my view the biggest threat to our society uh, in a generation. And if we don't tackle it, and t and you know. Desperate times calls call for pretty desperate measure, measures, and every option needs to be on the table to make sure that we give people the opportunity to own their own home if they wish to do so. Tom, just quickly, would the Lib Dems green, build on the green belt? Everyone else has given their answer. I can't remember if you said whether you would build on it or not. I didn't. Um, I, I skirted round that question, actually. <laughs> no. uh, typically evasive. You must uh, be doing my job man. then. <laughs> um, I think that. <clears throat> The, 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 the green belt is of variable quality, and I think there are strong arguments for uh, if, there are, if there is perhaps a, a low quality area of green belt for swapping it for another part of, uh, sort of in, in the vicinity uh, for, to, to create so that, so that you end up with the same amount of green belt, but you free up some of it for, for, for developments. But the, the focus should be very much on uh, brownfield sites as the starting point and greater density developments around transport hubs to, to make best use of, of uh, the space that's available and reduce the need for people to travel by car. Okay, thank you. Um, we'll now move on to our second question um, from Thomas Rouse. Is Thomas Rouse here? Please, no, Thomas Rouse isn't here. But there is another question which is of a similar ilk, um, which is from Rasha. Rasha? There we go. Uh, my question is regarding the counter-terrorism bill. 
Uh, it's invasive, it creates a culture of suspicion among students who want to speak out and challenge ideas. And what would you do to propose, uh, what would you propose to do to ensure that this bill, which is full of ambiguity in regards to how it defines radicalization, isn't used as a tool which will curb freedoms in institutions? And what will you do to reassure my friend who laughed at me and told me that I'd probably end up getting my name on the list of suspects just for asking this question? <laughs> So I think considering the battering the Green Party have received for their policies on terrorist groups or rather controversial groups, um, Natalie, would you like to start on that question? Um, well, first of all, I guess, Russia, I'd like to express my sympathy and understanding of why you feel like that for answering the question, and you absolutely shouldn't, because universities need to be the home of free speech and discussion. And there's a really important principle that we need to set here, which is you know, hideous organisations like IS, ISIS, are trying to destroy freedom. We have to make sure in protecting that freedom, we do have to take steps to protect that freedom, that we don't destroy the freedom by, for example, in terms of uh, digital uh, surveillance, um, not obeying the same kind of principles that we, should, that we should obey in the general law, things like surveillance shouldn't be mass, but only on the basis of suspicion, it should be under judicial oversight, uh, and that when we're talking about you know, collection of the data about communications, that should be protected in the same way as the content of the communications are. Um, in terms of the um, counter-terrorism bill specifically, I think the um, terrorism exclusion orders really risk making us less safe when absolutely they should be making us more safe, and that's a really important issue, that they can see people deprived of their British passport left to wander around the world, and that's a real problem. And I think what we need to do is really look around the rest of Europe and look at some of the best practice that's going on. And countries like Sweden, Denmark and Germany, in fighting against radicalisation, in trying to tackle some of these ideas, there's, you know, one of the key things they do is really look at networks of people's family and friends and support those and, and help those to work together. What we need is an inclusive society. It's people who feel excluded who can tend to go on the radical path, and that's you know, entirely the wrong direction. And in terms of you know, universities, it's a really tough balance in terms of, I was actually in Cambridge recently, uh, and the same night there were big protests about um, Marine Le Pen coming to speak. And I think this shows an interesting example of the kind of balance that we need, because the protest was were saying she's just being given a platform. It wasn't a debate. She was just being allowed to speak. And I think you know, ideas... We need to draw a line, obviously, in things like homophobia and incitement of racism and all the rest of it. But ideas that are difficult, what you need, one of the things you need to make sure is make sure there's an opportunity for them to be challenged and debated, not just presented wholesale. So I think that's one of the key principles we need to look at. Okay, but I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't you say that Marine Le Pen was racist, though, and inciting racial hatred? So in, under your own argument, you would have no platform to her as well. Well, well I, I think, you know, she's, she's in, it, it, it's an interesting example because it's in that difficult area. You know, she is an elected representative with a large number of MPs. But not in this country. No, but, you know, I, I would be inclined to think that if, you know, she's being challenged, those ideas are being challenged, you know, you, because otherwise what's going to happen is, particularly in universities, is the event will just be organised outside somewhere else and it will happen and it won't be challenged. So, the, the, you know, it's, it's not easy. None of this is easy at all. But basically making sure that universities are places where difficult things can be debated, again, we come back to the not protecting freedom by destroying it. Thank you very much. Um, any of the other candidates like to take a pop at it? Maybe explain prevent to the crowd? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. The, pre the prevent program, maybe. How does how are the conservatives justifying the prevent program? Well, firstly, um, I j just want to say to the, to the lady who asked the question. Obviously, I, you know, my sympathies entirely to you, and I'm very sorry to hear that you you do feel, um, you know, un under your friend feels under suspicion, or, or anyone, particularly at university here in London. Um, I'm really proud uh, that London and this area, Camden that I've made my home is a wonderfully diverse, um, mixed cultural um, uh, community. And this 
this country and indeed certainly this borough has been be has benefited so much from the cultural diversity that uh, we've had and not not recent you know this has been something going back hundreds of years the United Kingdom has always um, welcomed different cultures and different uh, pe people from different backgrounds different beliefs and I think fundamentally we're actually a, a pretty broad-minded, pretty tolerant country. We welcome freedom of speech. We welcome people with different views. We welcome people who challenge, um, you know, uh, some of the assumptions, I suppose, we have in society. But what I don't think we uh, tolerate is people um, from overseas who come over here seeking to undermine our democracy, seeking to undermine our civil liberties, seeking to undermine our fundamental respect and tolerance for each other. So, um, Sorry, are you referring to UKIP? <laughs> Unfortunately, I guess we have to let them through, but uh, I'm sorry, they're not here tonight to defend themselves. But, um, you know, Theresa May has um, banned uh, 83 hate preachers from coming over here. Now, there's a debate to be had, I think, and there has been in the House of Commons, actually, over the last Parliament, about whether or not we should be banning these people. My, my view is we should. They don't respect democracy. They don't respect our society. They don't respect women's rights. They don't respect gay rights. I don't think we want them over here. And so, frankly, I'm, you know, uh, fully supportive of the Home Secretary, ta Secretary taking a very tough line on uh, issues like this. Um, in terms of what the Conservatives have committed to do, um, we, we are going to um, put in statute the channel... Um, uh, de extremism program um, uh, in the next parliament. This is a, a, um, going to be a well-funded program to work with um, people uh, across all communities to fundamentally target the root causes of radicalisation amongst people growing up here in Britain. Um, and I think that's the way forward. We need to work with people, um, have a cross-community dialogue with people of all faiths and all backgrounds um, and uphold, in my view, um, the very British principles of tolerance, diversity and uh, respect for democracy. But the Prevent programme isn't targeting people who undermine our democracy, it's targeting children in schools. Um, and if you actually, if you look at, I mean, I mean, how, how can the Conservatives justify having criteria like being critical of UK foreign policy and being critical of US foreign policy when everyone in this room, I guarantee you as a SOAS student, is both of those things. So they've fulfilled two out... <laughs> <coughs> so... My question for you is, do you think PREVENT is actually targeting people who would undermine our democracy, undermine our civil liberties or whatever? Or do you think PREVENT is doing the job that it is meant to be doing? The, the counter-radicalisation um, programmes that, you know, that we've been running, um, a lot of them are in their infancy. This is an incredibly difficult topic uh, and issue to tackle because you know, it's not as if extremism suddenly appears before us and we, and we deal with it. Extremism amongst people can, can be um, somebody sat at home alone on their own looking at um, radical, radical websites um, unbeknownst to even their family. You know, the causes of radicalization in our society are so complex. Obviously, you know, any kind of uh, top-down imposed program is not going to always hit the solutions. We've got to keep working and making sure that we've got people um, at grassroots level dealing with, with this issue. And we've got, it's a learning process. It's not going to be uh, perfect. But what I will say in terms of the approach to um, the security services, there's a wider issue about civil liberties here. We've got to have a very public debate um, about where we draw the line between civil liberties, our own rights to pr freedom and privacy, which I feel particularly strongly about, not just as a Conservative, but because that's part of you know, uh, being British. Um, but also, we've got to recognise an incredibly, the incredibly difficult job our security services have to do to keep us safe day in, day out. Um, there is a lot of work that they do that we don't know about because of the risks of their work being undone if it got out into the media. They have an incredibly difficult job. Obviously, we need to scrutinise them and hold them to account, but let's have that debate about you know, a, a proper balance between civil liberties and keeping ourselves safe in this country. Uh, Tom Brake. We'll be taking unsubmitted questions after the submitted questions. Uh, Tom Brake. Okay, well, I'm going to start where uh, Mr Blair finished um, in terms of the, the balance between civil liberties and uh, protecting our security. That, that is what we, the Liberal Democrats, have been trying to do in the coalition government, where uh, we came to power, and the first thing that we did quite rightly was we got rid of identity cards. 
uh, something that Labour wanted to introduce. And the reason I felt strongly about, uh, about the need to get rid of them is because my experience of growing up as a teenager in France, because I spent 10 years in France as a child, was that the identity card and the requirement to carry an identity card was something that enabled uh, the French police on the underground in, in, in Paris to pick out principally uh, people who were non-white. And those were the people they were stopping. I never got stopped uh, as, a white, uh, as a white teenager and asked for my identity card, but a lot of people who were Algerian, Moroccan, Tunisian, they were being stopped, and the identity card provided the reason uh, for the police to, to stop people. So we were right to get rid of the identity cards. What we've also fought very hard and, and successfully opposed, although I think the Conservatives would like to introduce this if they get elected uh, as a majority government, is what we've called the Snoopers Charter. And this is the power that would enable the security services to look at and log every single website that all of us accessed and keep a record of that. We've said that is a step too far in terms of uh, the security services ability to monitor activities uh, the conservatives would like to introduce that what we have agreed with however is the idea that there should be a fixed ip address for every single device that uh, that people own at the moment uh, whether it's our phones or anything that is connected you have an ip address for it but that ip address only stays with it for a very short period of time and then it switches to another one. This means that it is very difficult, almost impossible, for the security services to be able to keep lo a log of who the owner of a particular device is. We don't think there are major civil liberties implications of, the, of if these security services need to find out uh, who was using a particular device, of them being able to do that more easily uh, than is currently the case. And that is why uh, we agreed to that. So that is what we've tried to do. It's very clear that, um, uh, for instance, in, inciting hatred is something that we would not support uh, at all. There are, there are no sort of uh, freedom of speech uh, rules that allow people to incite hatred. And if that is happening, then the, 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 the police uh, and uh, the relevant authorities should be clamping down on that. We believe in uh, freedom of speech, but that does not extend to inciting hatred against others. And what about Labour? Quickly from Labour. Uh, Rasha, we've, we've heard some nice words here, but to answer your question, there are two things that need to be done. You need to repeal the statutory obligation on universities to monitor for hate extremism, which is in the Counterterrorism and Security Bill, and you need to repeal the criminal liability of vice-chancellors uh, if they don't monitor uh, uh, the uh, hate preachers. The best way to counter, of course, uh, the evils of extremism is to allow it uh, into free debate and to dissect it and to diminish it uh, on the pros and cons. It's very easy just to drive this underground, which is essentially what the counterterrorism bill is going to do. The loophole uh, which the Conservatives have put forward today, that essentially Oxford and Cambridge Union are exempted uh, from the ban um, on monitoring and uh, hate preachers is that essentially because these unions aren't linked to the universities. That's saying the unions, they use the, uh, the property of Oxford University and Cambridge University, but in the eyes of Theresa May, they aren't linked to the university. So if you wanted to hypothetically set up your own little uh, uh, union uh, debating this, you could set up something which is not affiliated to the university here at SOAS, but happen to meet in the common room. Or, if you wanted to meet, you could meet in Starbucks. It's inconceivable that we can monitor every single Starbucks and put the same statutory obligation on Starbucks to monitor for hate crimes as uh, the government are trying to place on universities at the moment. Thank you very much. Um, so I think we'll move on to the third question. Now we spent 15 minutes on this. Um, so the third question, I think, is from Francis. Do we have a Francis in the room? Uh, hello. So what legally binding commitments do you plan to make to ca uh, tackling climate change? Um, the key is legally binding. Tom break. Uh, first of all, I'm, I'm, I, I mentioned at the beginning that the reason that I got involved in politics was because I thought we were neglecting the environment. And I'm very pleased, therefore, that um, uh, Ed Davey, who is now the Secretary of State for Energy and Climate Change, has been taking the lead 
globally, in fact, in terms of pressing for uh, legally binding targets for CO2 emissions. Uh, what we've seen in, uh, in the last five years is that the amount of energy uh, electricity generated from renewable sources in the UK has doubled so far, and we fully expect uh, that by the time the figures for the end of March uh, are complete, that in fact the, the, that, uh, that amount will have trebled. So I think that is a good, uh, a good result. We are uh, delivering a switch from coal which is a major the thing. If, you, if you're worried about climate change and you're worried about CO2 emissions, the top priority is to get rid of coal. And that's why the whole, the whole debate about shale gas is quite interesting because the opponents of shale gas say, well, you shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't use shale gas. However, I think there's strong evidence that shale gas actually provides uh, an easy route or an easier route away from the use of coal in coal-powered fire stations uh, to substituting for gas. Gas which, of course, uh, could potentially, at the moment we don't know how much, uh, but it may be that the UK uh, might be able to, to produce substantial amounts of, of shale gas. That gas we are currently getting from Qatar, and it's coming in a large ship with a very significant CO2 footprint, uh, or may indeed be coming from Russia. Uh, and uh, creating our own gas here, shale gas here, creating the jobs here, ensuring that we operate with much higher environmental standards than happens, say, in Qatar or in Russia, I think is something that at the very least we should be considering uh, doing. I'm, I'm flanneling a, a bit because I can't actually remember what the Lib Dem uh, pledge in our manifesto is. I might have to Google it in a second and come back. They're I'm in support sure. of fracking, aren't they? So Sorry? They're in favour of fracking, aren't no, they? I'm, I'm talking about the, the, the reduction of the, the CO2 uh, target uh, that uh, we uh, want to reduce the, the percentage of CO2 by. I will I'm, I'm Google quickly and come back with an update shortly. <laughs> I'm going to come to the specifics of the question at the moment, but I really do have to take on a couple of things that have uh, just been said, uh, particularly on might. fracking and shale gas. If you ask, speak to the industry, they say that even if things go ahead according to plan as they'd like them to, they're not expecting to, they wouldn't expect to see any significant shale gas production in Britain until the early to mid-2020s. We need to entirely decarbonise our electricity supply by 2030. Are we going to create this whole industry and then shut it down a few years later? Do we really expect to having created all of those, um, all of those companies, all of that influence, all if we don't change our political system, all of those potential political donations, and then go, right, OK, we did that for five years, let's close it down. And we don't have to. What we have is the exciting revolutionary possibilities of renewable energy. And we already know about the mature technologies, wind and solar. There's the really exciting possibility that I really want to talk about all of the time to make sure people know about it, which is uh, tidal lagoons. There's the first proposal for Swansea Bay, which could be one of five tidal lagoons, which in 10 years' time could be providing 9% of our energy needs. And there's also the absolutely critically important issue of energy conservation. I'll invite you as you're walking home tonight to see how many lights you can see on in office buildings, in shops that don't need to be on. And that's just a tiny fraction of the reality of how much energy we waste. And that's why we back the energy bill revolution, which would put serious money into home energy conservation, could lift nine out of 10 households out of fuel poverty, create up to 200,000 jobs and cut carbon emissions. Shale gas is entirely the wrong direction, not to mention the fact that we need to work out how to leave our fossil fuels in the ground, not go looking for more. I know there's a fossil fuel divestment program uh, uh, campaign here at SOAS. We very much back that. And you know, it's simply the wrong direction on shale gas. So I really want to pick that one up. Would you go to jail to stop fracking? <laughs> Would you follow in the footsteps of the former leader? Well, of course, Caroline was found not uh, guilty of any offence <laughs> with a great true. many other people. In fact, many of the people who've been arrested at, uh, at both Barton Moss uh, and at Balcombe, uh, mo a great many of them were found not guilty, and the policing of that is, is a whole other issue that perhaps well, I'm getting a bit too far away from the question. The politician in court for something the public actually support, though. 
Well, yeah, I mean, you know, it wasn't for expenses wrangling or cash for questions or anything like that. I know it's really strange. That's Green politics is a different kind of politics. Um, but I do also want to pick up other point of the, uh, the claim about the success of this government on, on renewable energy. Uh, the, the, the European League table came out. <coughs> We're getting 5.1% of our energy needs from renewables. That puts us ahead of Malta, Luxembourg and the Netherlands. <laughs> now, remember I said the figure was 5.1% of energy from renewables. Sweden is getting more than 50% of its energy from renewables. We are getting left behind on this. And finally, too, and I'm, I'm going to get to the question now, finally. Sorry, I know I took a while. Um, it, what we need, I'm not sure whether you were talking Britain or globally in terms of Paris talks. I mean, what we, ne what we need is, in terms of those Paris talks, we need to try and get genuinely binding limits on all countries in the world fairly shared out. But what we need to do when we're thinking about Paris is also not get ourselves as we did in Copenhagen into an either or situation where we think this has either totally succeeded or totally failed. We've got to get the best possible deal that we can get in Paris and then we've got to keep fighting every day afterwards to, get a, to improve it and make it stronger. And I think that's a really important principle so that we don't get to the same situation as we were in Copenhagen. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I, mean, I think just picking up on the point of the Paris talks, actually where this uh, battle against climate change is going to be won and lost is actually in the emerging uh, economies and developing markets. Every year, 10 million um, Indian and Chinese middle class uh, um, <coughs> percentage of the population join the middle class there. What we've seen over the past 30 years in China is 400 million new uh, uh, members of the uh, middle class, each of whom have bought air conditioning units, refrigerators, plasma screen TVs, mobile phones. But we have all those things. No. <laughs> and, mm. <laughs> Apart from air conditioning, Tom, obviously. Tom, if you let me... Tom. Tom, if you let me finish, okay? <laughs> Tom, of course, uh, we, we cannot deny the emerging uh, economies the same rights as we've had ourselves, okay? What we can do is we can think about smart ways in order to reduce the energy efficiency, uh, sorry, increase the energy efficiency of all of this electrical apparatus. Okay, and also uh, this presents an opportunity for our companies uh, for green tech exports as well. So really what we need to do is to get binding commitments <laughs> on uh, globally uh, on uh, climate change and CO2 uh, reductions. And that's where the battle is going to be won and lost. Will, would you like some more water before you launch into the environment? I would love some more water, Tom, Thank whilst you. he's filling up his water, do you have an update on Lib Dem policy for uh, well, us? I, uh, <laughs> I, I'm afraid the, the, the mobile reception in here is not very good. But no, uh, <laughs> Wi-Fi is really good, I though. I do want to just very briefly come back on, on Natalie. Um, of course, to get uh, renewable briefly. energy, you require investment from private companies. What we have succeeded in doing under the coalition in the last five years, as I said, we have doubled, probably trebled the amount of electricity that has come from renewable sources. We are now, I think, the world leader in terms of offshore wind. And the Cardiff Bay Lagoon project that Natalie referred to, of course, is something that has been uh, approved under the coalition government. So I, I think sometimes perhaps she needs, she needs to give the coalition government a little bit more credit um, than she is willing to uh, in terms of some of the, the, the green uh, projects that we've come forward, including, for instance, the Green Investment Bank, which is the first bank in the world of its nature that provides funding specifically for environmental projects. So actually, I think that we've got a pretty good record. Will, would you like to quickly wrap us up on the environment and we'll move on to our last submitted question. Okay, yeah, very quickly. Um, uh, uh, climate change is incredibly important, not just because it's the future of our, our world that we're talking about, but saving energy is good for consumers. It cuts their bills. Energy prices obviously have become a very topical issue, certainly under this parliament. So this government has rolled out the most ambitious programme to save energy, the, uh, the smart meter programme. In, 
and the proposals are, we've already started this, um, and over the course of the next few years, um, every household in the UK will have a smart meter, basically, which will tell customers um, where they're spending uh, the most money on their energy consumption, tips to save energy, and that will end up really bringing bills down. So we've been very serious and very committed you know, to help customers with their energy bills. Um, as Tom said, we have um, created the first green investment bank in the world. We've committed three billion pounds of, of, of state money to that. Um, and we, this green investment bank is seeking to uh, uh, attract private sector investment. That's right, the nasty big private sector companies that Natalie doesn't like, uh, to, to attract these companies to invest in renewable and clean energy. Um, we've got a very advanced uh, renewable energy um, uh, industry in this country. We need to do more um, to, to continue to foster that. Uh, the Tidal Lagoon Power Company in Swansea Bay that's been mentioned is a very good example of that. We've also built the first nuclear power station for 20 years at Hinkley Point. Uh, that will go a very significant way once that comes online to solving our energy cr um, sh crisis that is uh, approaching. Um, on the wider point, I agree with uh, Nick, actually. Um, uh, I never thought you'd say hear, hear those words said again. Um, but um, it's uh, very important that we have a leadership role. The United Kingdom needs to play a leadership role, both at the Paris talks and future climate change talks, to work with emerging economies who have a significant um, uh, carbon output um, as they are industrialising. And obviously, it's very hypocritical for us as the United Kingdom to say, well, you know, we had our industrial revolution a couple of hundred years ago, and, you know, we've had all the benefits for that, but, but you guys need to go slow, really, because, you know, uh, it's, 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 it's polluting the atmosphere. So we need to work with them. We need to make sure that they can balance their obvious pressures to r rise, increase living standards and prosperity in these emerging markets with a respect for climate change and supporting, you know, a sustainable future for everyone in this planet. Let's go quickly on nuclear power. Uh, well, yes, I... I saw, I saw sure. Natalie's r nose wrinkle when the nuclear power point was well, made. Well, but Tom well, I, I, do, I do believe, unless I misheard, that uh, Will Blair just said that we've built a new power station at Hinkley. That's a little bit ahead of ourselves. We haven't even agreed the funding, and there's a challenge from Austria in the European, uh, under European regulations, it's likely to delay any funding decision for at least two years. So I think you've got a little bit ahead of yourself there. Uh, well, I mean, the Greens wouldn't build any nuclear power, would they? So uh, no, absolutely not. So we just uh... <laughs> Tom quickly. Fine, very, very quickly. It's a, uh, with a great sense of relief that I can tell you our target is 80 percent by 2050. <clears throat> 80% reduction by 2050. Thank you. Uh, what, what mobile phone network do you have, Tom? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's the room, honestly, it's the room. You've lived through it. Oh, wait, no, you haven't. You, you, you weren't here when it was built. Um, we'll move on to the fourth question, which is from Dea. Um, okay, so internationally, there have been progressive moves to legalize drugs, particularly marijuana. What is your stance on the war on drugs? And would you like take a different approach, like for example, legalization or decriminalization of drugs? Um, Nick? Um, so I have to say that the Labour Party, they haven't published their policy on this in the manifesto. I, I know only too well from uh, being at SOAS. SOAS is uh, unique. <laughs> the policy department got a bit high, sorry. <laughs> uh, unique, uh, unique relationship. Uh, with drugs, I'm also aware that this is filmed and also uh, not under Chatham House rules. I, I do think that um, uh, policies actually to tackle uh, the damage of drugs has failed. Um, I think it's failed in this country. I think it's failed uh, ever since actually uh, uh, Britain started importing opium into China. Uh, uh, in 1830s. There's a long history of this. I, I can probably guarantee that within the thir next 30 years we'll see a seismic change in our, our attitude to drugs and all that I can say is that hope to be a part of uh, uh, a kind of broad-minded thinking on that. I think the damage uh, from uh, anything is almost when it's not taken in moder moderation. Uh, driving uh, Drugs underground, prostitution underground, uh, 
even uh, hate speakers underground. It's the damage uh, it derives from when these things are driven underground. It's not when it's out in the open and you can uh, monitor it and legalize it and uh, tax it and derive benefit from it in that respect. But the Labour Party haven't said whether they'll be no, pushing the for Labour further... Party haven't. They haven't said, OK. Um, well, on the Conservatives? Um, well, I, the Tories haven't pub published their manifesto on this, but I'd be very surprised if they were proposing to legalise um, marijuana. Um, obviously, it's <laughs> you never know, um, but... Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I personally, I'm not in favour of uh, um, legalising uh, marijuana. It's an incredibly uh, difficult issue, the issue of, um, of the war on drugs. Um, but, you know... If you look at the, the, the figures, um, drug use, particularly amongst young people of, of marijuana, is, is coming down and has been coming down quite significantly. Same as alcohol, actually, as well as uh, and tobacco uh, use. Um, so we've got to see this issue in its context. And um, if you look at studies uh, from across uh, the world where marijuana has been legalised, it's seen a spike in usage, um, again, particularly amongst young people and adolescents, underage people. Um, and... I've, I've looked into this, you know, not in, in incredible detail, but, a bit, you know, I've looked at it quite carefully, and I cannot foresee a situation in which legalising cannabis would end up um, ca causing any more problems than it... Uh, it would cause more problems than it solves, I believe. Um, there are, I know, some very, very impassioned arguments uh, in favour of legalising it, um, particularly um, for on medical grounds, and I do certainly uh, respect those, but... You know, looking at it, I can't see uh, how it would help um, the situation. Um, I think the really important thing is that we make sure that people understand the risks, they understand the harms, and people are informed enough to make the right choices. Um, one, you know, uh, the scenario, if, um, for instance, cannabis was legalised, uh, is a hypothetical question for you. Who would manufacture it? Because it wouldn't be, you know, it wouldn't be some... Well, it wouldn't be manufactured on Natalie's golf course. It would be manufactured, I dare say, by the very people, you know, a lot of us seem to hate. Big pharmaceutical companies. What about the tobacco companies? They'd start uh, manufacturing it. You know, would we, we be really happy to be putting money back in these organisations' um, pockets, you know, for the uh, manufacture of government-approved cannabis? Um, I don't think that sounds quite right. And I think it proves the point that... If you open the Pandora's box of legalisation, there's a lot of unintended consequences uh, to work around. But with medical, <coughs> sorry, with medical marijuana, though, I mean, presumably it would go into the hands of pharmaceutical companies and things like that if a private contract was given out on the NHS. Would the Conservatives do that, maybe? Uh, no. Just n no cannabis for no <laughs> <laughs> Like, I, I can't foresee a situation in which we would legalise cannabis. Yeah, that's not going to go down well at Sarah, as, <laughs> as Nick will tell you. I'm, I'm sorry, yeah, I'm sorry. But, uh, <laughs> his observed behaviour, he never partook. He didn't inhale. Um, <laughs> Tom, the coalition government looked at legalising marijuana, didn't it? Well, um, first of all, uh, I think the war against drugs has failed, and I think there are now a number of, of uh, presidents and prime ministers in countries, particularly in South America, where they think that as well. Uh, and that they want to look at different ways of trying to tackle the issue. What I think the government should, should do, uh, and this is what we have pressed for in the coalition, is look at other countries like Portugal and Spain, where they've adopted a different approach. And what they've done there is that they have, uh, in effect, decriminalised personal possession of drugs, uh, and all drugs. And what they have found is that the consumption hasn't spiked, the people haven't suddenly thought, great, it's decriminalised, so I can go off and, and, and uh, you know, smoke this or, or inject that and I, I won't suffer any consequences. Uh, what they have found, actually, is that it is much easier for people to get help from a medical point of view if they do not risk uh, being criminalised by perhaps presenting uh, at a hospital or, or at their GP. So, so presumably you'd be in favour of treating addiction as a medical disease as yes, well? Yes, I mean, we, we think that the, 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 the war against drugs should be one that is fought on health grounds 
uh, not criminal grounds, and we think the evidence from Portugal is very strong that this uh, actually works. And uh, I do wi uh, wish Nick well in his having a, a broad-minded discussion with his Labour colleagues, because uh, some years ago, when uh, the Labour Party were in power, I had a discussion with a, a Labour Home Office minister, and I said to him, if I could demonstrate to you that a different approach <coughs> to drugs, uh, which would um, improve people's health and reduce crime and involved decriminalizing drugs, would you support the idea of decriminalization? And he could not say yes. He had to say no. Even if I could prove that it was better for health and it would redu reduce crime, he was not willing to entertain the idea of a different approach uh, towards dealing with drugs. Uh, so good luck with your discussion with your colleagues, Nick. If you I, I, I guess it depends who you spoke to there, Tom. I well, mean, it's uh, pretty, not, not pretty unanimous within the Labour is, Party that um, with the exception of, say, Paul Flynn, uh, there, are, there is virtually not a single, single Labour member of Parliament who has been willing to say something different from the party line, which is just to stick with the approach that we've got Tom, now. Tom, that's based on your hearsay, though. No, that's based on me being a member of Parliament and having been the Home Affairs and Justice spokesman for the Liberal Democrats and having been a member of Parliament for 18 years and actually listening to your colleagues uh, twisting and turning on this issue and never willing to adopt a, an approach that is more pra pragmatic and actually delivers the results in terms of improving people's health and tackling crime. Okay, so in the absence of you naming any names, maybe we'll agree to disagree well, on I this. Well, I've named the name of the, the one person, the one Labour MP who is willing to entertain a different approach, Paul Flynn, and I'm afraid the rest of them have been noticeably silent or indeed very aggressive when anyone has suggested that perhaps there's a different approach to drugs than the one that... Uh, Tom, with all due respect, do you think they'll tell the Lib Dems their uh, inner thinking on this? Well, uh, they've had many opportunities in many debates to express their points of view, and I am still waiting. Natalie, what about the Green Party? Will the Green Party go further than legalising cannabis? Will they legalise all drugs? Well, uh, uh, <laughs> that wasn't a hope for all drugs. <laughs> <laughs> you have any particular things in mind? Um, <laughs> Uh, I, well, I do, I, do, I do just want to, want to pick up something Will said, and um, I stress here that I have an agricultural science degree. It was my first degree. Uh, and he was, Will was very concerned about you know, big agribusiness taking control of the marijuana market. There are things called heat lamps <laughs> and lights. So we're going to grow it at home, are we? Is that the well, idea? Well I, well, I think... You know, How, how's that affecting your energy commitment? Sorry. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, of course, if you're, if you're doing it off your solar panel, then you're using your own energy in the home generation. Um, uh, just for the record, we believe the war on drugs has totally failed. We believe drugs should be treated as a health issue. Uh, we want to certainly decriminalise marijuana, and we want to take... Because this is such a fast-moving area, and this is... One of those rare areas in which um, Lib Dems and, and, and uh, I can agree on lots of things on, on lots of things in this whole policy area is we want to take the best evidence from around the world to work out what the best regime that we could set up at that time. And because it's a fast changing area, you've got to rely on the best evidence based policy that you can. But, you know, I mean, war on drugs, really? So the, the um, government's chief officer when it came to drugs was fired, wasn't he, for saying that horse, ri horse riding was safer, or rather was more dangerous than taking MDMA. So <coughs> would you look towards you know, the professional advice in that sense as well, not just from abroad, but our own scientists saying, actually, this war on drugs isn't working, we need to legalise more than just marijuana? Very much so. What we've got to do, and I mean, this is what we want to do in all kind of policy areas, is rely on evidence-based policy making. You know, that's, there's a lot of evidence in this area, and it's growing by the day. Um, okay, I think we'll now move on to questions <laughs> submitted by the keen audience. Um, thank you very much for that, by the way, candidates, and for the people submitting the questions as well. Um, so, you please, sorry I don't know your name. Um, the lady over there, please, as she did put her hand up before anybody else, uh, before I even spoke. Um, and then you up there, please, in the blue harem trousers. Um, firstly, you say um, money is very important, but why? What are you going to do about taxing people like Green and you know all these people that, that hide their millions or billions elsewhere, and everybody seems to take no notice? And uh, also another question: um, in most countries in Europe, 
um, love children or children born outside marriage get equal rights to inheritance from, uh, as to any other children, but in this country they don't, they're just totally ignored. And I think that's really quite important. So the first question was about tax evasion or other tax of, of ta yeah tax evasion or tax avoidance, and the second question was about children born outside of marriage. Um, would anyone like to take the tax will yeah. tax? Or Natalie, we Nat all right, all right, you all take it and you can go for it, Mele. <laughs> <laughs> Natalie, you start them. Okay. Well. Um, there's a very good campaign which the Green Party backs, which is to say in the first 100 days of the next parliament, we should introduce a tax dodging bill that would put, pressure, put um, responsibilities on the banks uh, to report tax dodging, and that would also institute something that the Green Party's been uh, promoting for years and was in Caroline Lucas's private members' bill, 2011 Tax and Financial Transparency Bill, which is country-by-country country reporting, which says, very simply, if you want to, want to operate in Britain, do have a business in Britain, you also have to report the other countries in the world where you operate in, what your turnover is there, what your profits are there. So if you're, for example, a coffee shop chain that serves what I consider to be really lousy tasting coffee, and that may already have been mentioned, you know who I mean, um, and 50% of your profits are made in a global tax haven where you've got three a staff and an office dog, that becomes evident. So the tax dodging bill is one important step that should be coming in the first 100 days of the next parliament. If you look at the figures on HMRC's own very conservative figures, we're losing 34 billion a year. If you look, look at Richard Murphy from Tax Research UK, he says more than 100 billion a year. This is an absolutely critical situation that has to stop. If we think of another one of the, uh, the tax dodgers, um, the website Amazon, the road out there, Russell Square out there today, there will have been lorries going around delivering Amazon parcels going around that square. All of us collectively, our taxes are paying to maintain that road, and Amazon isn't. It's a parasite that's not paying its way, and that has to change. Nick? So, uh, I mean, Natalie, just to pick up on your points in the tax dodging bill, what you need to do is actually be as clever as the companies that are avoiding the tax here. You mentioned a, an unnamed coffee company. The way that they avoid the tax is that they essentially pay a royalty from their UK operations for the license of their emblem to a Luxembourg-based corporation. This royalty uh, payment, which uh, nicely rounds out at the sum of their profits here in the UK, which essentially reduces their uh, profits to a minimum level here. At the same time, you need to so you need to close down that loophole for IP royalty payments. This is the same structure as a well-known search engine uses and a well-known manufacturer of smartphones. You also need to reduce the ability of private equity firms to offset uh, the interest payments which they've done, used uh, for leverage buyouts against the profits of, let's say, a well-known uh, high street retailer in, uh, for a pharmacist. Essentially, um, so uh, taking a, a completely random uh, example, this pharmacy used to contribute about 890 million uh, uh, pounds worth of profits. Now, with the deduction of the interest payments, which were loaded onto it by the private equity firm that took it private, uh, essentially, it contributes £13 million pounds worth of profits. Again, the corporation tax is reduced there. So you need to be as smart as the people setting up these things. And you're absolutely right. Companies that uh, benefit from the stable uh, business environment uh, that we provide for them and do not pay their fair way uh, and need to be brought to account. I mean, isn't the problem, though, I mean, it's... It it's all very well saying that they need to be as clever as the companies avoiding the tax, but isn't the people advising the government on tax law advising the companies on tax evasion? Yes, uh, uh, absolutely. So how do you stop that from happening? Uh, well, because then they're always going to be one step ahead of you. Well, well if, I, if I could say you, you probably need to have uh, some uh, more expertise. Uh, a tax expert, uh, that's what we need. Yeah, well, no, uh, this is... He's, they're everybody's tax expert, that's the problem. Okay, well, uh, we're going to say that maybe you don't need a political class just being your lawmakers, okay? You need a broader variety of skill sets that are in there. For instance... Uh, 
I, I can just say that I do uh, intellectual property law as my career now. I understand exactly what the systems are that are used uh, by uh, these companies to avoid tax. But I'd also like to say that you too have a choice in making uh, these companies uh, uh, pay their tax. You have a choice which overpriced type of coffee you decide to drink. Okay, and I would. Uh, you have a choice which pharmacy you decide to uh, to shop at. Uh, please, there there are options there. The way that you make this change is actually uh, you bring public pressure on them, so you too can play your part. And, and can I just add to that? You know, lots of the chains. There's different stories about different ones. Think about the local independent, because there's very few independent local coffee shops that have ten subsidiaries in the Cayman Islands. Um. Tom, quickly, sorry, and then Will, and then we'll have a couple more questions. Okay, I won't forget it. Don't worry, on it. Um, okay, so Tom, if you go quickly, I mean, and then, but can first, we keep it quite brief, just because yes, we're very constrained? I mean, first for time. of all, I'm not, I'm not sure that I would necessarily have used the language that Natalie used in relation to a particular company. This is the sort of the Ian Hislop moment in "Have I Got News for You," where he asks, uh, "Is one of their lawyers in the audience?" But um, if you've libelled them, I'm, I'm sure they'll be they'll be they'll be uh, gentle on you. Um, I think the, the the first question was about tax on high earners, and uh, what we have succeeded in doing in this coalition government is something that we are able to do as a government, and that is we have ensured that uh, previously, before the coalition came to power, uh, bankers were able to pay less tax than their cleaners because they were using capital gains tax, lo tax loopholes to do that, and we have plugged that particular gap, so you do not have uh, that uh, happening anymore. The other thing that we would like to do in relation to uh, to, to high earners is what's been dubbed the mansion tax, which is really um, a way of putting additional council tax bans on properties that are worth more than £2 million, of which there are a, a large number in London that would generate, uh, we think, um, uh, over a billion pounds extra revenue. So that's another way which I think we could affect the uh, or tax higher earners. I think the real problem that there is with What's been talked about in terms of, of companies like Amazon and Google, of course, is that this is actually about international uh, tax law and the ability that those companies have simply to relocate, to move their headquarters around, makes it actually very difficult for the UK government to, uh, to, to clamp down on it. And so the, the 30 billion that Natalie said was going missing or the 100 billion that Natalie said was going missing, it's actually very difficult for the UK government to get their hands on that because of the, the schemes uh, and the tricks that people, the companies, international companies are using. Okay, well, if you want to talk quickly about the tax question and then maybe briefly mention or go on to talk about uh, the issue of children outside of marriage. Okay, um, on the tax issue, I believe in low taxes. I want to see taxes as low as possible across society. But what I do believe is when taxes are levied, they should be paid in full, particularly by those organisations who make the most money. If you make profit in the UK, you pay tax on that profit in the UK. This government has worked very hard to invest um, heavily in uh, HMRC, the tax collecting organisation, to improve our measures of enforcement against um, those organisations who seek to evade paying their dues to society. And um, we estimate that, HMRC estimate, that um, by the time these reform programmes have gone through, we'll be able to recoup an extra £5 billion per annum. Um, over the course of the next parliament. So this government has worked very um, intensively at not just domestic but international level, working with the other countries of the G7 and the G20 to clamp down on international tax avoidance. And I'm very proud of the work that this government has done uh, through DFID, the Department for International Development, sending HMRC experts over to developing economies to work with their tax raising authorities, making sure that international, multinational organisations that have operations all over the world, and a lot of them in the developing world, are properly being taxed uh, their dues in developing countries as well, because that's the problem. A lot of these international, a lot of these de developing economies don't have the infrastructure that we do, um, and the experts in HMRC have been going over there to help them train up their tax collecting experts to help ensure that the revenues go to these um, um, economies that really do need them. Um, can you just remind me the second question? Sorry. Shit. 
frankly, because the, the fathers can just walk away, permanently walk away, and not even remember them in their wills. So I'd like you to put a bit of, don't laugh about it, put, put a bit of vigour into that and say, how can these children feel better? How can they feel more equal? Well, I think that's... Well, I think that's a very important point. I'm glad you raised it, and I, 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 I will. Um, I'm particularly pleased to say that in in this country, for instance, um, we've got um, we've got gay adoption, we've got people, um, children growing up in a number of different types of families, and I hope, and I, I don't, I think our society encourages those children to feel as equal as any other child growing How up. How do any... the Conservatives reconcile the marriage tax break with? illegitimate children not feeling as wanted as legitimate well, children. I don't think you could say the marriage tax break makes children not born, but it born definitely, out of uh, But does it do not think it places classes. marriage and heteronormative marriage in a higher and, and echelon? And actually makes the children worse off? Uh, no, I don't think it does. Absolutely does not. It? No. But it says that marriage is the, is, the, is the best form of a relationship, so we'll give you a tax break. I mean, what else could it, it say? It's not making a moral judgment on uh, marriage. What it's doing is em empowering people... No, I was asking how he reconciled supporting Ill illegitimate children's legal equality and status with... I, no, I, 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 think, I think I understand and I think we understand what you're saying and as you said I think he addressed the point and I was trying to move the debate on. No, 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 it's completely understandable. I'm sorry if you thought I was moving the debate on too hurriedly. Um, Again, I, I'm, I'm honestly, I think it's brilliant that you're passionate and I'm not trying to shut you down, but everyone else is entitled to time as well. Um, Natalie, do you have anything really quick to say on this lady's second question here about illegitimate children? Well, well I think I mean, it's, it's very clear that um, parents have a responsibility to contribute to the, to, the upper, to the raising of the child, the cost of the raising of the child, and that certainly should be pursued. I, I, you're a barrister, you know more about law and certainly European law than I do. Um, but I think the problem is you have in Europe lots of um, uh, inheritance laws that prescribe how what parents have to leave to children, how a, a um, inheritance is split up. We, we don't. We have a fr free will arrangement where people can leave their um, money to whoever they like, whether it's family members or not. So we, we do have a very different legal regime, is my understanding. Um, okay, we'll take a couple more questions from the audience because we are running quite low on time. Um, so in the white badge at the back, all in black. Could you stand up, please? Sorry. Just so they can see. You can sit down again if you want. Thank you. Um, so as I'm sure you're aware, disproportionate, um, there is disproportionate over-representation of black and minority ethnic young men and women and working class people in the prison system. In addition, this prison system has been increasingly privatised and this is also extended to detention centres where children are still held illegally despite the Liberal Democrat and Conservative bill that would make this illegal. So I'm basically wondering um, what you guys think about reducing the influence of the, um, the prison industrial complex and what are you going to do to stop young people getting like going to prison? Thank you. Tom Bright. Well, first of all, the pledge that, uh, that we made was actually to stop innocent children who were in families that were being deported uh, put into prison, and that we have delivered on. And I've been to the centre uh, where those families are, uh, are, uh, are kept or are, are placed before they are deported from the country. So that part of it wasn't about children... Uh, being in, in young, young offenders' institutions is actually about... 
Yeah, but you said that the Liberal Democrats had not delivered on our pledge. We have delivered on our pledge. The pledge was very specific about ensuring that families that were being deported, where the child was completely innocent, wasn't ending up in prison as part of that deportation process, and we have delivered on that. In relation to how do we stop young people going to prison, which is a separate, uh, a separate issue, which is clearly the main focus of your, of your question, uh, what we have said, and Nick, Nick Clegg said it very recently, is that we want to, uh, we want to stop short-term prison sentences because it is very clear from the evidence that um, it is completely counterproductive to sentence a, a young person to a short-term prison sentence. Uh, you are much better off uh, if that young person has a community sentence. If they get a short prison sentence, there is virtually no support at all in prison. What they tend to do is just meet other more hardened prisoners uh, who have been there for longer. Uh, and that is why we have worked very hard uh, to ensure that that uh, sort of diversion from prison for young people happens and that we are not sentencing young people to short-term prison sentences. The other thing that we put emphasis on is the idea of restorative justice. Uh, again, it's very clear that for many people, for many victims, the most effective way of addressing a crime and the most effective way actually for getting to the, to the person who has committed the crime is uh, restorative justice, where obviously if the, if the victim doesn't want to do it, they don't have to do it, uh, but if, if they want to do it, then it's an, opportun uh, an opportunity for them to explain to the offender the impact that, that what has happened to the victim has had on the victim and their families, and that has proven to be very effective uh, at uh, very, very high levels of, of satisfaction amongst victims victims and also very good at deterring offenders from committing offences again. Nick. Um, as with everything, there is a cause and effect. Uh, Labour Party tries to tackle the cause. One such way is uh, our commitment to reduce child poverty. It's, uh, one of the achievements of uh, the uh, previous Labour government, essentially the creation of a sure start uh, um, uh, child uh, daycare centres which managed to uh, take 800,000 children out of child poverty. This was a tremendous success. Essentially, if you reduce uh, the poverty, then you reduce their attraction to crime. Sadly, uh, the uh, coalition's record uh, from the austerity cuts have actually resulted in um, child poverty now increasing, hitting past the million mark. So this is as a direct result of the uh, cuts to uh, local community budgets. So again, something that we'd want to do is ring fence the uh, Sure Start community budget funds and uh, hopefully that way try to alleviate the amount of children who are attracted by a life of crime. I think we'll take one more question, unless Will or Natalie are particularly... I just key. wanted to quickly... So if Will, Will wants to respond to the... Just and then quickly. Natalie, if you could go, but quickly, and then we'll take one more question from the audience. Your point about um, prisons is a, is a very important one. My uh, father um, worked as a prison governor uh, with responsibility for learning and skills at a, a jail down in Dorset, where I grew up. And um, through him, I learned so much about the crisis in our prison population where many of these people, a lot of them very young people, um, as you say, a lot of them from very poor backgrounds, um, uh, are in many ways victims as much as criminals. They have had an incredibly difficult start in life. A lot of them uh, are illiterate, are innumerate. And um, my father's view, and certainly a view that I share, is that we need to turn our prisons into centres of learning and rehabilitation because we need to... This is the one opportunity that the state has to have some real intensive engagement with these individuals. If they are, if they are on medium-term sentences, we can sit down with them, train them up, give them skills. I'll give you a quick example. My father instituted a programme of um, putting um, aquariums in, into the prison he worked at. A lot of people ridiculed him and said, what on earth are you doing that for? You know, you're just trying to turn this place into a holiday camp. But he did it because every aquarium had a prisoner assigned to it, uh, and they were trained up in aquarium management to look after the fish, that was their responsibility because so many of these people have never had to have any responsibility in their lives. They were given a qualification, they were given respect, self-esteem, and it's those important things that so many prisoners don't have so that when they come out, they've got some basic skills, they can get themselves a job and get them back integrated into society. Natalie, very quickly. Very quickly. Um, 
I can say, very much share your concern about private sector involvement in prisons and probation and the whole criminal justice system. I said in, the, in my introductory remarks that we're, in, we're opposed to privatisation model for public services, but particularly there should be a principle that we need to hold to very dearly. The coercive power of the state should never be privatised. That takes away democratic control and it should not be happening, it should not happen. And just on immigration detention, we're opposed to immigration detention. So, what I think will be the final question. Um, I did promise the guy in the blue harem trousers could ask a question. I'm sorry, everybody. Maybe a question in favour of the Conservatives, considering the colour of your trousers. <laughs> <laughs> Dare I ask? I don't believe in liberal democracy. Um, and precisely for the reason um, my sister over there mentioned earlier, is the influence of the prison industrial complex and the influence of other interests that most of you up on stage represent. Um, does that mean that I should be kicked out of the country under the new Counterterrorism Act, which has been passed? Did you know that actually been passed on the 13th of March? Um, you, do you know what uh, PREVENT actually is? Uh, and finally, do you know what a university is and how free education, how do we get to free education, liberated education, how do we get to liberated ed education? That is my question. Okay, I, I think everyone kind of understands the sentiment of your questions, but if you could phrase it into a, a more specific question in order to have free, more concise answers. Free education. Free how education, what is your opinion? No, and would how you do kick we me get out there, the country? not what is your opinion? Um, so I think considering the state of play and the Liberal Democrats have a lot to answer for in universities about free education. Well, uh, clearly t um, tuition fees is a, is a, has been a problem for us. Um, you'll, you'll be aware of what happened. Um, it was our party policy to get rid of tuition fees. Uh, that, that is what... That, okay, thank you. I, can I finish? We, we, would you like to listen to my answer, or, or do you want to shout? Okay, well, like... Marham. Yeah. Again, I would agree with the sentiment of what you're saying largely, and I, would, and I think a lot of people here do, but a lot of people here also would like to hear what the politicians up here have to say. Well, that's your opinion, but other people have different opinions that deserve respecting as well. Um, and well, clear, you're not even here. You don't even go here. I'm sorry. The, the, the pledge that, uh, that was made was actually in two parts, and uh, we didn't deliver on the first part of not voting for any increases in tuition fees clearly, and that's why Nick... Uh, made that very public apology, which went on to go viral on YouTube with his song. Um, but the second part of the pledge, we did deliver on. The second part of the pledge was to make the tuition fee system fairer. We now have more children, more young people from disadvantaged backgrounds going to university than ever before. A third of students are actually financially better off under the present system uh, than they were under the last system. So in terms of the second part of the pledge, which nobody seems to remember, which was about making the system fairer, we have delivered on that. And I'm afraid that what Labour have come forward uh, with um, is of huge benefit to one particular group of students, and that is the best off students, the richest students, because of course uh, the poorest students or the, the, the graduates who earn the least uh, would not actually be paying uh, back if they're earning less than 21,000. Uh, and then uh, obviously the, the repayments go up. So the, the really wealthy uh, people who, who have graduated and have gone on to work in very well-paid jobs, they are the ones who are going to benefit from uh, the reduction in nine, from 9,000 to 6,000 uh, pounds. And I do wonder uh, why the Labour Party have chosen a policy which is of most benefit to the richest people when they have taken up well-paid jobs. Nick? Um, I, I query Tom saying that he's made the system fairer when he's trebled. Well, the IFS says that we've oh, made, the Institute indeed. Fiscal sorry, Studies sorry, Tom, I say my has bit? said that we've made the system sorry. fairer. Sorry, Tom, could I say my bit? Has the IFS said it's fairer? Yes. <laughs> IFS have said it fairer. Well, <laughs> it depends well, they how they yes. define that. But I, I well, would say that it. trebling the cost of tuition fees... Sorry, Tom, just let me say my You've bit the in floor. the same... Get on with it. Just... <laughs> 
In the same way as you asked for your ability to speak, please show me the same courtesy. Tom. I did, actually. So. Okay. <laughs> also, uh, also, what I think is sad is that the, um, the Lib Dems reneged on their uh, chance to scrap tuition fees for a chance to be in government. And I think that is actually the really sad thing, is that as soon as the little whiff of government... <laughs> Tom, Tom just gobbled it up. And that, I think, is really sad. So, anyway, so uh, back to on, on tuition fees. Labour Party have a fully funded uh, uh, commitment to reduce tuition fees, the maximum cap, from 9,000 to 6,000 pounds. They also have a fully funded commitment to increase the maintenance grant by 200 million pounds uh, in order to make lives easier for uh, students um, across the UK. Um, that is a solid proposal, and uh, it's the only party to date that's actually come up with something solid and costed. Sorry, what, what was the question? <laughs> scrap tuition fee. Yeah, why, why won't Labour scrap tuition fees altogether? Why, why are they just reducing so, them to so, 6,000? So the issue is that it actually needs to be costed. Where is the money going to come from? Okay? And, I, um, and there is, I think, uh, I think there's an advantage in actually uh, contributing to something in which you derive the, the most benefit from. It's a slightly unfair that... Uh, for instance, uh, students that don't go to university subsidise those students that do go to university and have, what, five times multiple uh, salary earning power across the, uh, their careers. So I, I don't think it's actually reasonable not to contribute something to your tuition fees um, and also it would create a funding gap which would affect this university. That, in that way, I think that a proportionate reduction in your tuition fees is the fairest way. You continue to get the world-class education that you deserve, and you also make a small contribution to the higher education in which you derive the maximum benefit from. Will, would you like to <coughs> briefly yeah. talk about free education, and then Natalie? Yes. Um, this is um, obviously a, a topic very close to all of your hearts, and I completely understand why I was very lucky to have a university education and I'm very very grateful for the opportunities that that has given me but I think what's important to point out is the university education isn't the be-all and end-all there are many people young people growing up in this country um, who decide for very good reasons that they don't want to go to university they want to do something different this government has introduced uh, three million new apprenticeships across the country allowing young people from a range of backgrounds uh, the opportunity to get on in STEM subjects and um, going into careers in advanced manufacturing and growing our um, industrial base here in the UK. So I think, you know, there's a number of different ways people can, young people can prosper. Um, I'm particularly proud of the fact that um, you know, more people from underprivileged backgrounds are going to university uh, under the current government than ever before. The changes to university finance were deliberately designed to make sure that the poorest people in society pay nothing, basically. And as um, people uh, earn more, they will make contributions. But we've raised the contribution level from £15,000 to £25,000. So you won't pay a penny of what you've uh, taken on in debt until you earn over £25,000. But my final point is to say that, actually, um, Nick, Nick um, made this point. Um, we get a world-class education at UK universities. They are one of our biggest um, brands and biggest products, actually, UK uh, university education. People come here from across the world. Many of you, people, many of you guys here tonight have come from uh, a number of other uh, overseas countries to come here and learn. I'm very proud of that. I think the UK uh, university sector is um, a leading beacon of learning and uh, enlightenment across the world, and I'm very proud of that. Thank you very much. Uh, Natalie. I think you know what I'm going to say. The Green Party, I'm very proud to say, at the last conference confirmed, confirmed a policy uh, that we've had uh, for some time. We believe education is a public good, and the policy that will be in our manifesto will be zero tuition fees for undergraduate degrees. <laughs> and the, the way that we believe that should be, cost, it should be paid for is from general progressive taxation. Uh, 
because at the moment we've got a situation where you know, someone pays their three years or more at 9,000 a year. One of them, you know, two people, one of them goes into the city, pays off their loan in a couple of years or maybe even with the first year's bonus and never thinks about it again. Alternatively, someone maybe goes and works at a community, you know, does a social work degree, goes and works at a community garden, has a modestly decent salary and goes through 30 years of their life paying money each year while knowing they're never going to pay the loan off. Current figures show that 75% of students will never pay their loan off. 45p in the pound of those loans will not be repaid. This is not a system that's fair and it's not workable and it cannot continue. And I just want to pick up one more point about the whole issue of free education. And I do particularly want to pick up on um, Will's language here. Brands. <laughs> Products. I don't believe you should be thought of or should think of yourself as customers. I think you should think of yourself as part of a whole community of scholars at different stages in their career. Thank you very much, Natalie. Unfortunately, we've run out of time, um, so we won't be taking any more questions, but thank you very much. Um, if you could join me in thanking the candidates. If you could also join me in thanking the ABSOC who set tonight up as well. And the Beer, Georgie and David in the SU office as well for helping the ABSOC put this together. Um, Not just for the bourgeoisie, he said in a bourgeois accent. Must be nice to come back to your old university. It is, it's good to see.